just like to welcome everybody to the uh, Worcester School Committee meeting, and uh, I would stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the National Anthem. I pledge allegiance. Here. Vice Chair Johnson. Here. Member Kamara. Here. Member Mailman. Here. Member McCullough. Here. Member O'Connell Novick. Here. Mayor Petty. Here. Okay, we have the consent agenda. Approve on the roll call. We just have the minutes of the September 1st meeting. Roll call. Yes. 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 Yes, we have public comment. Any member of the public may address the committee regarding any item before the committee for two minutes. Those speakers should state their name, their residence, and the item number that they're gonna speak on for the record. Okay, anybody wanna speak, just your name and. I hope this is, I hope this works. This the height of this is a little off. Uh, good evening, oh, my good. name is Margot Barnett and I'm a resident of Worcester. Um, I'm speaking on item 2- GB2-203, which is a, um, the report of, of the um, Memorandum of Understanding. I've been following education justice is issues here in Worcester for some time. I was very appreciative of City Manager Augustus's proposal to remove the school resources officers from school buildings. Over the course of the year, I had the opportunity to learn about the state standards for police officers interacting with students. I think there has been some confusion about whether the standards set out by the state, which were then become, um, became mandatory as of August 2022, were applicable to our system with school liaison officers. I had heard clear legal opinions that the standards do apply to us. When I saw the draft MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with a definition of the SLOs, the school liaison officers, being exactly the same as the state definition of the school resource officers, it was evident that it was exactly the same. The, um, the school um, liaison officers fit the legal definition of school resource officers it's a distinction without a difference. And also clear that the people who drafted the Worcester MOU were aware of the standards. Therefore, it's unacceptable to have a document that does not meet the minimum standards set out in the state's document, which, as I said before, has the force of law at this time. I recognize and so much appreciate that the new administration of Worcester Public Schools is dedicated to a supportive and restorative model for student discipline. Both the aspirations of the school safety plan developed here in Worcester and the provisions of the state mandates were created in that same spirit. 
we can uphold those aspirations as well as state law by adhering to the standards set out by the state. Removing several provisions that limit when and where and how, when and how police officers can interact with students would violate both this spirit and state law. Therefore, I ask that the MOU be rewritten to conform to state standards. Thank you. Okay. Um, just to be clear on this subject matter too, as I should have said it before, Ms. Barnett is absolutely correct. And uh, so we will have to uh, put the standards in place, but also people can add to this to the standard if we'd like. So if people have comments, you're more than welcome on that to come up. There's your uh, name and city of residence and item number. Good evening, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Melinda Martin. I'm a paraeducator in the city. I also reside in the city and I vote in the city. Um, I just want to bring to your attention that we have been in negotiations for the ESP unit for just about a year now. Um, we have presented many, many items to um, the district team, the lawyer, and the two school committee members that sit on the negotiations. Um, in almost a year's time, we have not received any written um, counter offers or anything written from the district. We've simply been negotiating with ourselves. We proposed a new pay schedule as we had proposed last year. Um, th the attorney said that they disagreed with that pay schedule. We presented a new one. We're in okay. terms negotiating with ourselves um, no, because we yeah. presented <laughs> okay. a counter offer to our up? original okay. offer. No, I, I appreciate it, and uh, I let it go, but I don't think it's on the agenda tonight, so uh, technically, but we hear you loud and clear, so Thank I'm you. sure. I, I, know, I just want to yeah. ask that, you know, because I, I, <laughs> I do have my two minutes. Um, no, it's a two minutes an item on the agenda. Oh, uh, well. I'd like, I'd like, can I have 30 more seconds, please? Yeah, you can have 30 seconds. Okay, so yesterday a paraeducator from another school contacted me and said she was pre when she was hired, she was presented with a certain position. She was not given that position and was in turn moved to a different position that she has no training for. She's, going to, she's probably going to resign. Um, it, it just seems frustrating that we're so short-staffed we're being stretched in every direction and I think negotiating to get us our living wage as we you know have asked for um, you know we're, we're short in every school I can tell you inclusion hasn't happened in all the classrooms at my school okay. um, because we're short-staffed thank but you Melinda appreciate you. you being here okay anybody else Good evening, my name is Ruth Rodriguez Fay. I'm resident of Worcester. I just want to share with you something that I want you to consider. As the first school community liaison for the program here in Worcester many years ago, the district that was majority white students had a wonderful curriculum, counseling. There was never any policing in the school. And so many of my community wonder why today, when the majority of students are Latino, all of a sudden the district feels they have to have policing in the school, taking money away from counseling, and our children really need. Given the situation that we live in, more counseling, understanding, of our culture and how it works, work with the community. So taking away money from those services to hire police, I think it's something that maybe you should consider rethinking. It's something that, I, that hurts our community, especially when we look at that Latino students are suspended 85% higher than white students for committing similar infraction. This is something that we need to consider. What is it that our children really need besides having police in school? So I ask you to consider and work with our community to assist our students to do better in school and to stay away from, you know, 
Um, and just so you know, I was on a panel on the Harvard School to Prison Pipeline, and there was a juvenile court judge from Suffolk County who testified that since the MCAS became a high school requirement, and we consider the MCAS a racist test, he witnessed a jump in his court over 200%. The majority were black and Latinos, and over 95% of them had failed the test. We find that what's happening in our school with our children is missing out on what they really need in order to succeed and to become, you know, the adults that we want them to. So Thank I'm just asking you to consider this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing nobody else. Andrew, we have one person. You got that person in? Who do we know who it is? Mary Jo, is that who it is? Yes. Okay, Mary Jo, go ahead. Your name and see your residence and item number. Uh, I, I too am speaking about the MOU. Um, I uh, am speaking to you as one of the uh, um, uh, of one of the two folks that were able to chair the mayor's commission on Latino the uh, um, schools and um, education. And I just want to remind folks that when we wrote that report and shared it with all of you, one of the things that we felt strongly about was this item. We really um, wanted whatever Worcester's final role was, that it reflect the state standards, that it reflect the work that the that the state had done to make sure that and that uh, these kinds of um, relationships between schools and law enforcement are fair and transparent and even handed. When we uh, looked at this draft, we too are asking um, to take it back and to try again um, for the for the issues raised um, a little uh, by um, speaker one. There, we don't see um, that uh, the that um, what we had asked for was adhered to. There are a few key pieces that are missing from this draft and what the state has set out as its um, standard. The state standard was written under Healy when she was the AG. We would like it to be at uh, at uh, adhered to, um, particularly the pieces about notifying loved ones about um, the interactions between and the you know um, schools in um, in um, students that is not here. That's a key standard that Latinos care uh, that have noted. Uh, is not done, and we would want that to at least start. Um, and then um, the and then just to also uh, state that when we did the research and we saw that Latinos were affected more than other groups, even with the virus and everything that's happened, that gap has you know been there still. So it's still an issue that we need to work on. This 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 is a great step. The fact that we're going to have an MOU, we would just like it to be done right, and we ask you to take it back and uh, take a look at what's not there that is in the state um, standard. And a final note on uh, process: I understand that you know we were hoping to get this in January. It's much later in the school year. Um, and so whatever is going to happen from this point forth, we uh, would like it to uh, happen um, in a, uh, you know, quickly and with um, an openness. Okay. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Mary Jo. Appreciate it. Okay. I think that's everybody, Andrew. Okay. So I'm going to close that part of the meeting. We're going to go to the report of the superintendent. Uh, the Worcester Public Schools priority strategies for the, for the school year of 2022 to 2023. Uh, Madam Superintendent. Thank you through the chair. Good evening, everybody. Happy to be here this evening to give an updated report on um, what's been going, what we plan on doing this school year as we uh, prepare to move into um, the development of the strategic plan. So, Tonight, the school committee will receive an update on key priorities and strategies for the 2022-23 school year. Um, become familiar, 
become familiar with the next steps and the recommendations that I'd like to bring to you, and then provide feedback on these key priority strategies and um, the recommendations. So as your listening committee, what I'd like you to be listening um, for is, did we capture this idea of um, including pe people in decisions that impact them? That's really important to, um, to us as a district leadership team. We want to be sure that that is um, starting to permeate through how we work with um, people. And also that we have started to really try to begin to operationalize this idea of a culture of belonging and continuous improvement. So if you can just be listening through that lens, continuous improvement, culture of belonging, do you hear that? in the um, strategies and priorities, and then also um, let us know if there are um, this, the value of including people in decisions that impact them, that would be helpful. And then of course, anything else that you would like to add. So first and foremost, um, want to just couch this in the entry plan. So this is um, put into the, the superintendent entry plan that is on our website. This is just a piece of it, right? And to let you know that um, just moved into chapter two, we're getting ready to design chapter two. So chapter two, if you'll recall, is the listening to learn. This is the portion of um, the crafting of the future story of Worcester Public Schools. Uh, where I will be bringing forums of, of parents together, bringing forums of Worcester Public School educators together, um, meeting with principal groups, um, I'm trying to think of all the different people, and asking um, very structured questions um, to get similar, to, to start to get those themes, right? And so the questions are actually very broad. They're just gonna be the same questions. So the questions are going to be, um, what, is, what are the strengths of the district? Where are some opportunities for improvement? And what would they do if they were me as the new superintendent? And um, we're gathering a, or we're, we're looking at a platform. It's called um, Thought Exchange. We're, or we're, we're, find, we're looking for something that will be able to capture all this data so that we um, can then trend it um, and bring that together for you. Simultaneously, so first starting with the chapter two, um, and then starting to move into chapter three where I've uh, called it learning in action. We're actually in them visiting schools and I wanna you know, try to attend some department meetings or grade level meetings or just watching what's happening in our schools. So um, to start to um, align what people say and then is it really what's happening, right? And if there's any holes, we need to know that too, not for a shame or blame, but for improvement. Um, so that will be coming together then chapter. So I'm working on that, just getting it all scheduled and set up. I've got um, Yvonne Perez as the lead behind the scenes with Marco Andrade to help with all of that. So um, watch for that to be forthcoming. Chapter four will then be when we can take all this data, analyze it, bring some themes to you. Our goal is to bring it to you at the December meeting. Um, I may be a little ambitious in that, but I'm gonna still keep trying to make that happen. Once that's all done and we're, we all agree that these are the key themes, then we move into uh, chapter five, which is the actual um, designing of using that data to draft uh, or the refine the strategic plan for the district moving forward. The little heart and uh, there was, those are supposed to fly in to guide your eyes, but they did not fly in. It must be a PDF. So just to let you know that right now I'm on chapter two and chapter three, and then collectively we'll be together for chapter five in designing this entry plan. Oh, I'm sorry, the strategic plan. So that's all to set us up for next school year. You should be asking, our principals are asking, and we as a district leadership team are saying we need to be clear on what we're working on this year. So that's what the rest of this is going to be about, is what, this, what we're working on this year. Let me just acclimate you to what each slide is going to look like. I'll use this one as the example. So um, we have key focus areas. That's what's up in blue. So this slide is about the pipeline development. That's an important piece um, that we need to be working on this school year um, so that we start to diversify our workforce. So, by, so each slide will show what the priority area is, what we plan on doing by June 2023. That's the what. Then the strategy is the how. How are we going to achieve that? And then what should you expect as a deliverable? Uh, so for pipeline development, we plan on um, identifying, developing a pipeline, this is by June 2023, to diversify our workforce at all levels 
including um, developing models to access opportunity. And when we say models, meaning what are the different ways that families can find out about career op opportunities in our district, that if you are um, working in our, our community, our district already in a position and you'd like to move up, that we have clear ways by which you can do that. We don't have all that codified right now. So we, that's one thing we want to get in place. Um, how we're going to do that, we're going to create a, stack, a, a stakeholder work group who's going to investigate, develop, and define what we're calling the WPS criteria and model for pi pipeline development. And in that, we plan on including how we would identify people to you know, tap them on the shoulder and say, we'd like to see you move to the next level, or have you thought about this? So identifying, building, strengthening, and diversifying mm -hmm. our workforce. Um, the deliverable that you should expect by the end, by June 2023, is this criteria, so that we get to some, we start to get to some consistency about what does it look like um, to seek out talent and diversification in our community. We know we have great, um, we just have so much, so much talent here, and we have to be very intentional about how we find them and then how we grow them. Um, so we, the deliverable to um, the district will be to have this criteria and the model for pipeline development. I've asked Yvonne um, Perez, who is our chief diversity officer, to lead this work, and then she'll be bringing um, that stakeholder group together, and she will be the one that will make sure that this, uh, this deliverable is achieved. So pipeline development and just let's, we have to start with the people, right? We're a people organization. Then we bring them on and we wanna make sure that we're clear on onboarding so that we're setting people up for success. So by June, 2023, we wanna make sure that we have clearly defined onboarding experiences that are differentiated by employee type. So the teacher onboarding needs to look different than the onboarding of a paraprofessional onboarding of a principal, onboarding of a secretary, right? that all needs to look different. Um, and we wanna make sure that that includes um, orientation programs. How we're going to do that collaboratively, we're going to develop a standard of practice or an SOP guidebook for the departments and administrators who are involved in supporting all employees. Um, we have, I've asked Jennifer, our hu human resource officer, to uh, take the lead on this. She'll be bringing together our unions and um, the different people that, again, are going to be part of this process to get this guidebook in place. Lot, we, just, we need to codify things. If we don't have things in writing, then we can't even start a continuous improvement. It becomes very much what I like to call urban legend. So that's um, one piece. So we get our pipeline, we start diversifying it, get that talent in place. Then we have clear how we're gonna on onboard them, set them up for success. Then, as an example, this school year, you know that we launched a student information system, a new one, right? Well, it became very clear that we need some more work in the onboarding part of the student information system, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to personally thank all of the staff out there that have been just doing your absolute best to try to make sense of this new information system that is impacting your daily work. Um, and we, as a district, need to work with you to develop a standard, um, another SOP, standard of practice, for WU EDU implementation. So we've got some training, but we need now a plan for how we're going to implement this. The, the way that we're going to um, do this, or the, the how, is we're going to convene an end user stakeholder group. So I had the opportunity to meet with um, the 42-week uh, secretary union group on Friday afternoon. And they are just, you know, they are doing their absolute best in trying to implement this WUEDU. Um, but they, they know what it looks like each day on what's working and where the challenges are. So we need to bring people like that together at the table with us to help plan out the implementation. We're hitting that quickly because um, it's happening right now, right? So um, by the end of this school year, we will have a clear standard operating practice for WU EDU implementation that then we can plug into onboarding for new people who come on. And the people who will help design it are those who are using it right now. And so that'll include, how do we coach people in the use of this? They're doing it right now on their own. Mm -hmm. I would like it to be more systemic than that. So um, that's an example of pieces of work that will go into the onboarding in the future. 
Brian will be leading this work in addition to bringing in our IT and our um, ed tech, again, our secretaries and those who are using the system. Okay, so those are three big pieces. Still a lot of infrastructure. No, I haven't even gotten to teaching and learning yet, right? Um, so the next one, family and community engagement. This has become kind of since day one for me. I've, I kept hearing about it. And just so the committee knows and those listening, the way that we got to this is something would come to me and I would say, who leads this? And then we would all kind of look at each other. So that was some of what we need to figure out is who is leading different portions of very important pieces of the district? And then what they're leading, is it clear on where we're going? Are we in, you know, going in different directions? So family and community engagement is a really important element in a community such as Worcester. We have great community partners that want to be with us. They want to be at the table. They want to support. We have families that deserve to have um, information that is regularly available to them and that their schools have family engagement models going on there, right? So we, uh, by June 2023, we're going to design a framework for family and community engagement in Worcester Public Schools. That'll include a model for implementation. There are some schools in our district that are, they just excel in family engagement. We want to go and find out more about those schools, what they're doing, and take that model and, and replicate it. Um, one school in particular that's come to me multiple times, I've already told the principal, start writing down what you do. Well, it's kind of just the way we do it. I know, but it can't be just the way you do it. Like, we want to be able to make this the district way, not just, I think it was Woodland. Is it Woodland? Yes, not just the Woodland way, right? So that's an example. So how are we going to do that? Same idea. We're going to convene a diverse group of stakeholders. This, of course, will include um, parents. It will include community um, members. It has to include our principals um, to develop this framework. And then the framework itself will include kind of the what of what family engagement and community engagement needs to look like, but also an action plan behind it. Um, and I have asked Yvonne to lead this work as well. Last piece on infrastructure, building safety. And so if any of my principals are watching, this was not in the slide yesterday, so you did not miss it. I shared this last night with, yeah, you may not have it either. I just literally put this in. It came at probably about 3 o'clock this morning. So um, building safety. So we're working on this, but I feel like it needs to be called out. So um, we need to be sure that we're streamlining protocols and procedures okay. for um, our emergency response systems, both at the mm. school and the district mm. level, right? Monday was a great example of that. So we want to make sure that we're clear about when an emergency happens, that everyone knows what they're supposed to do. Again, both at a school level and at a district level. So that's the what. How are we going to do that? We need to convene a building safety work group who are going to review and refine our current systems and make sure that we have a cadence for rehearsing and monitoring. So I know when I went to school, and I know it's not a surprise to anybody, I grew up in California, we practiced emergency, I mean, fire drills on, and earthquake drills, right? Like we knew what to do. And, um, and so our children need to practice drills on a regular basis, and our staff needs to practice that. So when I say cadence for rehearsals, I'm talking about practicing fire drills, I'm talking about practicing um, emergency response, lockdown drills, and I'm talking about practicing, unfortunately, in this day and age, active shooter drills. People need to know what happens, what to do. We shouldn't wait, God forbid, we will never have to use it, but we want that muscle memory that we know how to use it, right? So we, we need to first take a look at what we have and make sure that it is meeting the need, and a work group will help do that. And then, once we do that, then we'll, we'll have this handbook that then we can refine every year. And it becomes a tool for us to use. So this is a new <coughs> one that you don't have in your packet, but really important to let um, you know as well as our community. Brian Allen will be leading this work, of course, in collaboration with our, um, our, our director of school safety um, to make sure that, again, that we have these pro pro protocols and procedures in place. So that's a lot of behind the scenes kind of work, right? That hasn't even gotten to the instructional components. But for any classroom teacher or principal, you have to have these type of things in place 
so that you can then layer on the instruction that needs to happen. And so now I'm going to go into what are we going to be doing instructionally for this school year. <clears throat> so instructional leadership development. Um, there is a model, we all know that there's a model at the state level that we're to use for um, supervision of teachers, supervision of principals, it exists. What we need to make sure is that we have refined and we have a calibrated system to build the capacity of our leaders to positively impact teaching and learning. We just, we need to be clear that, the, we need to be sure that we're all um, providing feedback to our staff in a similar manner. Of course, you're gonna put your spin on it, it's kind of like making salsa, you put your different chilies in there, right? But it's still salsa. So we still need to have um, some clarity around um, our instructional supervision system. So I've asked um, Dr. Morris to lead this work where she's going to bring people together to develop and implement an instructional supervision system to include training of our principals, our assistant principals, to include modeling of feedback and coaching on how to do that. So our quadrant managers will be instrumental in um, working with our principals so that we have some consistency across the board. Um, the deliverable will be a guidebook that then we can use through for the onboarding, but also that helps us to um, practice continuous improvement. Um, that is that one, so that's the instructional leadership. We anticipate doing a lot of that work uh, through our principal meetings. The next part is college and career readiness. So um, it is our job to make sure that all children graduate college and career ready with access to whichever opportunity they choose to go into. And so we want to make sure that we've got some consistency across that. And so we're going to ensure consistent implementation of access to college and career opportunities. We're going to do that by reconvening a stakeholder uh, group to establish an action plan for implementing the portrait of a graduate. So for me, portrait of graduate is new. I've heard um, that there was a lot of um, time and energy um, put into it last school year. What we want to make sure is that our principals understand portrait of a graduate, what that looks like pre-K-12, and then how does that, how do you implement that um, pre-K-12, and what does that look like in terms of access to opportunities for um, our students throughout their schooling. So this is a heavy lift, and um, first step is common language, common understanding. Again, what does it look like pre-K-12, and then um, how do we get an action plan in place? Dr. Morris is going to lead this work as well. <laughs> Accelerated student learning. So this is, of course, a priority, and it will always be a priority. So future state, um, we have great, so some really nice plans that I've come across um, in my reviewing data and just looking at what, what exists in Worcester Public Schools. So we have this framework for high quality teaching and we have a multi-tiered system of supports. We have two different documents. What we wanna do is operationalize both of those documents together so they actually are not just nouns, they become verbs of what we do and how we do this work. So in order to do that, again, we need to bring people to the table, so convene a committee to review those two different documents and develop action plans that then include training, coaching, modeling of instruction. In this work, it is very much about how do we make sure that tier one, the first instruction meets the majority of our students' needs, including language development, including children who access content differently and and demonstrate their understanding in different ways, all of part of tier one, and then what are the data sets that we look at to monitor if a child needs more, and then what does that look like, who does that at the school level um, before we even think about a more um, intense support system at tier three. So there's a lot, there's a, this is, of everything that I just went over, this is definitely the heaviest lift this will have the greatest impact on teaching and learning in our district. Um, we have these plans. What we don't have is how are we implementing them and how are we implementing them consistently, including how are we monitoring them. So we don't want them sitting separately. We want them to come together. And then we want to say this is what it will look like going forward. Uh, so Dr. Morris will be leading that work as well.
She's got triplets, so I'm gonna just, yes. So I'm, I'm just gonna tell you. So I, I, I made a little, um, I used a little analogy with the team. I said, someone told me one time, you know, here's your project and your project is your baby. Don't leave your baby unattended. So you can't leave your baby for someone else to, well, if it's going to somebody else, you better make sure they know what your baby needs while you're maybe doing something else. But you better make sure your baby has everything they need. So Dr. Morris is, now has triplets going on. <laughs> I think I'm almost done here. All right. School, uh, climate and culture for at both the school and district level. So you've heard me speak about this. Um, it's just now all part of this, this greater picture. We need to have a comprehensive wellness services and supports plan that supports a culture of belonging. Um, we can't leave it up to happen chance. We um, need to be very intentional. There are tons of people who want to come and work with us and support us. And so we're going to bring them to the table. We are going to be launching a diverse stakeholder team um, to design a three-year comprehensive wellness services and supports plan. We've already been talking with lots of different individuals. We've got a list that we're just adding, adding, adding to. Um, at the end, the, um, by June, hoping by May, actually, we will have this plan in place and ready to go. Um, in the meantime, we are putting out a request for qualifications for um, uh, providers to come and offer therapy in our schools as need be and, um, and additional support. So that's going out for this school year while we're designing this, this plan, right? Um, in our current structure, this would also be assigned to Dr. Morris. So that would be four. So that kind of takes me to next steps. So what are we going to do next? So we've got all these priorities now. Cabinet is clear on who's taking what and who's uh, responsible. As a team, we're going to backward map how these priorities are going to be um, implemented. Like how are we gonna make sure that we actually reach that deliverable by June? And we're gonna develop a progress monitoring system where monthly um, cabinet will let me know where they are in the development so that we don't wait until the end of the year and then say, oops, we had barriers, we didn't address those barriers, therefore that's why this didn't get done. No, we need to be monitoring it along the way. Um, not because I don't trust that the team's going to do the work, I need to know that if they're struggling that I can jump in and help with that or they can help each other, right? So those two things are really important. That will be happening while I continue the entry plan and we prepare for the strategic plan refinement. Additionally, I would like to increase the scope of our college and career office um, and thinking about taking a position that is currently not filled and make it a bit broader so that it brings all of these pieces of college and career um, under one house. So the chapter 74, the CTE, the early college, innovation pathways, making sure that our children um, graduate in four years and we're monitoring that and that we have post-secondary outcomes. That's a lot, right? And it's all sitting like kind of in, in different places. So we need to bring that together, working with our guidance counselors, creating, um, again, if we're saying portrait of a graduate, this is what our students look like at the end, how are we making sure that these different pathways lead them there? So that's, that's a big piece. Um, an additional number five is I would like to um, create an additional division in Worcester Public Schools. I'd like to call it academic supports. Um, and I checked to see what is it called in Boston, and in Boston they call it student supports. Um, it's my understanding we had something similar in the past. Um, it's a very common division um, in larger districts in, um, in California. And so this way, this is the, it's, it's everything outside of the academic side of the house. So it would include um, the behavioral supports, it includes um, family and community engagement, it would include um, all the alternative settings that we have, and, and, and it's all about the leadership over all of these pieces. Um, because you need both. You need leadership over the teaching and learning. You need leadership over the academic supports. And they need to, they need to go hand in hand. Um, we would put special education under this division, um, as well as um, our nursing. So think about everything that is not curriculum and assessment. Um, it's, it would go under uh, this academic supports. And so as a part of that, 
hiring a chief academic support officer who would work in collaboration with Dr. Morris um, to make sure that our, our systems align with each other, right? Teaching and learning and uh, wellness go hand in hand. Our, our learning environment needs to feel safe and, um, and so that you can then have the best teaching that comes out of it. Also would like to um, create a position called positive youth development. This position would work on uh, restorative practices, restorative justice, um, and making sure that we are training up people at our school sites around this work um, and, and collaborate, uh, align with and support um, our SEL model. So positive youth development and then a position for family and community engagement because we don't have that, again, that just kind of sits everywhere. Um, and that position would include um, oversight of our parent information system as well as um, I know there's an interest in, with the committee on um, some more consistency around school site councils and that position would do that. Before and after school programs, so extended school day, extended school year, that's the community engagement side of it. So this person is very much a people person and will help to develop that framework, but then also train um, at our school sites. So with that, I shared this with the principals, and I'm just going to close with this. So we have to take our first step, right? So you may or may not recognize this, um, this, this hiking trail somewhere. I don't even know how I got there, but I was there. Uh, first step. And as we take a first step, sometimes we may not know exactly where we're going. So this, these priorities are to help give clarity on where we're going so that we know that there's an end in sight. And as we work on getting that end in sight, then we can take a broader scope of what's going to happen in Worcester Public Schools um, through our strategic plan. And we don't even know what's beyond those trees, but I can imagine it's gonna be something pretty spectacular um, because we will be a model of educational excellence through a culture of belonging and continuous improvement. And so I close by reminding us that everything we do is about the children we serve. And these are our beautiful children at um, South High School and at um, Sullivan. So I welcome questions and feedback. Thank you. Mr. Member Johnson, for our member mailman. Thank you to the chair, through the chair, to superintendent. I, ju I just want to say thank you for this um, this report out. Um, I, I, I must say that I'm happy with what you're producing, the clarity of this report, and kind of the next steps that you're doing. And one thing that we've always talked about is, is transparency and putting it out there in the public for everyone to see on where we're going in the district. We really appreciate that, and I think I could speak for um, the members here um, of the school committee. Thank you again for your work. Uh, Member Mailman. So I definitely heard about um, you wanted to make sure we were hearing continuous improvement and that we were hearing a culture of belonging, and I, did, I do hear that, so that's very cool. Couple of comments. On the building safety, slide which I don't it doesn't necessarily matter what I heard is about the process for you know how we're going to handle a lot of different categories of things regarding building safety but I think that at one point we talked about inventory and about an audit of our buildings and I, so can you comment on that Madam Superintendent yes thank you through the chair um, if I had read my notes, I would have added that. So in, in addition to um, looking at our current practices, we are, also, we are also this year, and we've already, I believe we've found the company or we're finalizing, Brian's on the line, he might be able to confirm that, um, an audit of all of our schools, our processes and procedures in practice um, so that, the, and we will get recommendations there that then we'll be able to feed for next year. I, what this is about is, and so what are we doing this year to make sure that our schools are as safe as possible? Okay. So, so both. They, they'll, they'll be going simultaneously. Correct. But that seems to me those, those audits of that are like critically first in steps. So Yes. Two cents on that. Um, then on the last slide, number four. Increase this, put <laughs> college and career together. I, I struggle, I struggle. I have never felt like this district, which is putting more and more money. How much is it already gonna cost us? 
and how much more is in Doherty because we're going to have Chapter 74. This is significant dollars that we're putting into our programs and we have never really had at, we do in the school, but not necessarily at the district level, an expert on vocational education. And I just think a district our size with the kind of money where I just, so you're going to, I need to be convinced. And Sounds those are my good. comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it was Ms. McCullough followed by Member Kamara. And I think it's, okay, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you so much for this report. I, I agree that it ties in so much with what you've discussed with us um, individually as well, and really just the excitement on what the possibilities are for the district moving forward and the team that you're creating that's going to achieve these steps and really having you know actionable items and expectations and clarity around our process and how we're going to continue to elevate the Worcester Public Schools and I appreciate that you present expected outcomes so that we're looking through a report that we have a clear path for ourselves as well. Um, I One of the things that you have, it's also on the slide that Member Mailman referenced with number four is what's happening post-secondary outcomes. That's something that I've brought up several times in the past few years and I think that's so important that we know not only where our vocational students are going post, I mean, ending up post-secondary and what trades they may be ending up in and what they're utilizing, but all of our students, right? Because that ties into the success of the district overall and knowing where our students are ending up. And they're always part of us, right? So we want to know where students are ending up. The other thing I'm excited about is this whole discussion about the wellness services and support and the academic supports division, because I think We've heard so much in the past year about the social emotional learning components and we've heard from our school adjustment counselors and our school psychologists and you know our teachers and our staff and our students and we know that we already had challenges in this area and then we went through a pandemic. So I think having a dedicated division that's working towards providing those supports for our students is really going to be um, really beneficial for the district and I'm excited to see where things are going, and I appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Member Kamara. Thank you so much um, to the chair. I just want to say also thank you, um, kind of just highlighting what my um, colleagues have um, mentioned about this, thoroughness of this uh, report. Um, I know we're all thankful for that, and I am very thankful for that. Um, I will have few questions. Um, one is regarding the role in the office of the chief diversity. I see that there are a few items here that um, is in that is under the charge of our chief diversity officer, which is um, um, Dr. Perez, Yvonne Perez. And so my question to that is, are we, will these tasks that come out of um, this, like this report, be used to shape that role of our diversity office and what that is going to entail? Madam Superintendent. Through the chair. That's a great question. Hadn't thought it bit through that lens. Definitely the pipeline development, most definitely, because part of the chief diversity officer's job description included diversifying the workforce. So that will definitely be there. The family engagement and the community engagement naturally fits there too. Um, just hadn't thought it through that lens. So I would say yes, mm -hmm. um, just a different way of looking at it. Okay. Thank you. Because I certainly know that um, that is one position, I think, since it's been established that um, maybe for me, because I'm a new school committee member, that's a little bit wonky. Um, and I, I see all these great things as ways in which that we can use to um, um, bring more to that, to that office. Um, so awesome. My other question is about the oversight of all of these documents that are listed in this plan. Um, as we all know, like, it's one thing to create documents, right? But it's another thing to actually implement them in full flesh. Um, and so I also want to understand like, what will be the oversight in terms of ensuring that these things are executed in the documents. Madam Superintendent. Through the chair. Um, so this, so our intention is to really set the district up for 
being able to then implement a lot. Some of this will be implemented this school year just based off of like the SIS system, for example, the implementation there. The other pieces will then be ready to launch for next school year. I'm hoping that we can get it done so we can start doing it in the summer. Then we'll have, another, then we'll have a, an implementation side of many of these plans. So then benchmarks along the way. It is also, um, if it aligns with, and it, it seems like it probably will, the strategic plan, that it'll fold into that as well. So, and the strategic plan itself will have clear benchmarks and targets by which we need to be monitoring as a district mm -hmm. so that we can say that we atta attain those outcomes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanna say thank you for putting this together and for really giving us, um, me, I will speak for myself, us in general, um, kind of like a format in what the things, something that we can hold on to, to look forward to, and something that we can continue to speak about that is going to happen. And I think, um, not to be biased, I think this is the time that our kids in our district really have an opportunity um, to really get what they're supposed to be getting. Um, and I think we are on the right path, and I'm excited to be a school committee member. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Member Clancy. Thank you. So through the chair, most of my colleagues have already spoken on what I would, you know, was going to say. I'm two things. First, I'm really I'm very grateful that we're actually looking at our tiered system and seeing what isn't working. Um, because I know in the past we've we've been very quick to move students onto 504s, onto IEPs where things could have been implemented in the tier one. And I think that we could have, you know, got, solved some issues. Um, that have got, brought our students to higher level tier. So I do appreciate that. Um, the other thing is I, I, I appreciate that the team is all hands on deck. I know you mentioned Dr. Morris and Brian, the, you know, that there's, and Yvonne, that there's a lot that they're gonna be taking on and it seems like everyone's ready to go. So that's exciting to see. I will say the other thing that I'm very happy to find, um, to hear you say is working with our providers, our outside providers. It's something that I had asked previous administration to look into probably two or three years ago because I know that there's a lot of amazing providers mm -hmm. in our community that are just willing to come and work with our students and we've heard that our school adjustment counselors our school psychologists are like you know at their they, they have a lot on their plates right now so mm -hmm. I think bringing in people to help um, will you make a huge improvement in our students lives so thank you mm -hmm. Welcome. thank you Ms. Novick member Novick Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, may, maybe I'm maybe I'm in a different zone in more ways than one this evening. Um, I uh, I'm struggling. I guess um, my first question, I guess, always with a um, or for the superintendent is, um, as a, a student or as a teacher or as a parent, um, what am I going to see? What's what is the difference that this is going to make? Um, and I completely understand and obviously um, very much agree with a strategic focus. Um, but I also know the, not to use a common phrase, but sort of the urgency of now. And, um, you know, we've got kids in classrooms now, we've got teachers in classrooms now, we've got parents who need changes now. And so um, I understand the importance of making good plans and I'm in favor of that. What my question through the chair of the superintendent is, is what is it that happens next week? What is it that happens in November? What is it that we're gonna be seeing over the course of this year? Um, there are a couple of things in particular that I guess I, um, I think are really important that I um, would, would want to see represented. Um, <clears throat> including things like, um, I mean, obviously we're not spelling out who's in what stakeholder group, but I do think that the importance of student voice and student perspective um, and the student experience in our schools is something that we haven't really had a chance to look at. Um, and that I think that is, is incredibly important um, and is something that we really haven't been spending a significant time on. Um, I, I know that there's already been work going on on, on discipline, um, but I think that the community really needs to hear from us in ways beyond the MOU that I know we're going to talk about later um, of what it is that the district itself, separate from the Worcester Police Department, um, intends to do about that. 
Um, I'm, I get, I, I'm glad to hear some of the, the mental health thing, but I mean, that, that's been a screaming emergency for at least 18 months at this point, probably longer. And um, I also wonder about facilities beyond, um, beyond the thing. And I, I'm sure that, you know, any of us would have a list, um, but it's sort of, you know, if, if we're talking about um, the priorities and we're talking about it sort of this year versus longer term, um, what, what, is it, what, uh, what is it that we're going to see that's gonna be different this year from last year? Um, I, so I guess that's my big question. The other thing that I, I did just want to flag honestly with some concern is that um, the, the idea that we would be moving forward with implementation of Portrait of a Graduate when this committee has never voted acceptance of the work and where I know that a number of us had some pretty considerable concerns about um, the degree to which that actually had equitable um, district and community involvement, I, I, I would be concerned about that, at least in terms of that notion of people being at the table, um, which we were asked to look for, which I know is a valuable superintendent in any case. Um, I, I, would, I would reserve judgment pretty strongly on that. So if it's possible to get some perspective on that, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Yes, Madam, through the <laughs> Madam Superintendent. <laughs> through the chair. Thank you, um, Member Novak. So those are the questions that I've been asking myself many times as well, even as we were designing this. What will someone literally feel differently this year? What will be the different experiences? And um, the 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 core of it is people are going to have a seat at the table in the discussions. And so when people start to come together to design plans and to develop common language, it starts to impact their daily work outside of that time at the table. That I've experienced that regularly. I've seen others do that. It's almost like an osmosis. So students will have a seat at the table. We will be starting, I didn't bring it in here because it's just something we're gonna keep doing. We will have a student advisory, a, st a superintendent student advisory that will be part of that. As these plans are being developed or these action plans, they will be brought to the student advisory so that they can give feedback. But not just feedback, they can also in some of the situations, let's start with the portrait of the graduate. I don't know how much our students even know about that, right? So going to them first and asking them before we then take it to the, the adults. So they'll be part of all of this designing. They're going to have a, um, I mean, a, a great impact on their, their peers as well as those younger than them because they're going to have a seat at the table. So that's a big piece of it. This is people will be at the table designing the work, talking about it, um, and, and preparing us for next year. Or, but as, as part of that, it's their own learning that then starts to impact their daily work whether you're a classroom teacher, a school adjustment counselor, a principal, a secretary, whatever that might be. Um, so that's one of the pieces. W you asked about um, the, well, you, I don't know if you necessarily asked about restorative practices, but that's another big piece that is um, definitely part of everything we're doing right now. So just the way that we've reworked um, student discipline. So right now we have a temporary, um, fix, if you will, with bringing in a retired um, manager to work with our principals when um, some kind of discipline happens to work through how might we address this through a more restorative lens rather than um, a, um, a punitive lens. And so that's, that's where we're going right now. Once we get all of our quadrant managers hired, because we are filling the one position that Dr. Morris um, vacated and another one that's been vacated, I don't know for how long, um, we'll have four, then we're going to transition to instead of um, that, the, that when discipline situations take place, they will be going to their quadrant manager um, to talk through how might we go about this through a more restorative lens. Um, first and foremost, that needs to be our go-to. Students may, you know, they need a dis they need whatever the discipline side of it is, but the more important piece is the restorative and the learning that takes place there. So that's another change this year um, that 
parents should expect, that students should expect, that, um, that we will be working much more about restorative and inclusionary practices. Um, that will be our go-to first. Um, the last piece that I would say um, most specifically is really, it's the part around um, the instructional supervision. So um, we just had not had, a, according to the team, a very um, coordinated training approach so that all of our, our, those who supervise are calibrated around how to give feedback to grow a classroom educator or to grow a SAC or whomever you are, you're evaluating. And so um, ensuring that there's calibration so we have some consistency about what teaching and learning um, should look like, feel like, sound like in our classrooms, uh, that's something to be expected. All of that has a positive impact on student outcomes. Ms. Novick, all set? Uh. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the only additional thing I was actually asked, <clears throat> um, and I think that this, I just wanted to flag this for um, Dr. Moneris, is I had um, been asked if um, there was an intent for us to um, sort of revitalize uh, CPAC this year, and it struck me that that perhaps is something else that falls under that family and community engagement um, portion as well, because we've had sort of a lapsed CPAC for a bit at this point. Dr. Monares? Yes, that has been brought to my attention um, more than once, so definitely once that position gets filled, so what, what the committee can expect is that we will be bringing job descriptions back to you at the next committee meeting, um, and once that gets filled, then we can start moving in these directions of um, the parent advisories and that type of thing. The other piece that I didn't mention, but also that um, our educators should expect is um, that I have asked the teaching and learning division to um, pull together teacher advisory teams as well that will help to guide, um, you know, to, to provide that two-way communication um, with what happens in the classroom, with what happens at the district, and to um, design things as necessary. So that would be an ongoing piece. So both a parent advisory, well, three type, three ways, parent advisory, student advisory, teacher advisories. All set? <coughs> okay, good job. So I do a quick comment, a great report, much appreciated. And we waited for that for a little bit, and uh, it's almost like your goals and objectives are getting written, so, uh, which is good. So um, we wish you well, and you have our support. So. Good job. Thank you. And I do want to thank the team because um, they've been, we've been diligently working on this for, I don't know, about at least six weeks. And so they've been, they're, they're all hands on deck. And they, they know that their job is to lead the work, not to do the work. We bring the people who do the work, who actually are going to implement it, um, to the table because they'll give us the best information. So thank you, team. Okay. Thanks, team. Okay. We are going on to, we're going to accept the file. I guess we have to do a roll call. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Yes. We are on report to the Standing Committee, the Standing Committee on Governance Employees Issues, met on Tuesday, August 30th. Ms. Clancy? Thank you. So, through the chair, the Standing Committee on Governance and Employee Issues met. Um, on August 30th, my president was myself, Member Johnson, and Vice Chair McCullough. Representing the administration was Dr. Monarez, Ms. Boulay, Ms. Mahoney, and Dr. Friel. The first item that we took up was GB 1-285, which was to formulate a policy regarding the use and replacement of Chromebooks and their accessories. We had actually had numerous discussions on this in previous meetings, um, and at this point, we, I made the motion that we file this item and on our roll call three to zero, that item was filed. The next item was GB0-368, which was to create Worcester School Committee operational norms. I made the following motion, which was to request the item be referred back to full committee for a dialogue with all committee members at a future date. And that item was approved on a three to zero roll call. The next item we took up was GB0-28. And as most of you are aware, this is the item where we took um, school committee, we made some changes to the committee rules, meetings, and agendas. And the last portion that we were working on was getting the standing committee descriptions. Um, in our backup is the updates of the school committee descriptions, if there were changes made. And 
That was just the last part of this item that we needed. So on a roll call, the standing committee descriptions were approved and they were inserted in the rules on the school committee and that item was filed. The next item we took was GB0-2881, which was the response of the administration to request an outline in writing under the circumstances that DCF, which is the Department of Children and Families, is called regarding a family or child, particularly with in regards to student attendance. And Ms. Mahoney was there and she stated that every attendance situation is different and that they look at each student and family individually and that if parents decide not to send the children to school that the, and the district has been contacted, then D, and the district has not been contacted, then DCF would be contacted. We did have some discussion that we, there's going to be further communication between the administration and DCF looking at different things. So we're going to be holding this item um, for, further for further input from administration in governance. So on a roll call of three to zero, that motion was approved. The next one was GB2-119, which was to consider a one-year alteration to the district policy limiting excused absences to seven days in light of quarantine requirements during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Ms. Mahoney did state that all COVID-19 related absences were excused if a student tests positive or has been in close contact. I had brought up my further concern that in the student handbook that it says under the illness that the caregiver must submit a school, the school medical documentation of an illness and that requires um, students exclusion from school and that was the only way that that could be an excused absence. So I asked that the administration consider amending, looking at the current policy for the fact that some parents are able to get their children to doctors much easier than other parents can. Um, and Ms. Mahoney did say that the conversation, they have been having conversations with district attorneys regarding revamping this attendance policy. So on a roll call of three to zero, that item is going to be held in governance for further input from administration. The next item that we took up was GB2-175, which was part of the dress code policy. And Ms. McCullough stated that the dress code policy needs to be more equitable towards female students and would like the following proposed languages that she proposed that she sent to the administration, which is in our backup. Um, the administration is going to be looking into this policy and she, Ms. McCullough also asked that we get input from our principals and um, our staff in the schools. So on the following, Ms. McCullough made the following motion that this item be held for further input and on a roll call of three to zero, that motion was approved. And on a roll call of three to zero, the meeting ended at 4.51. Everybody good? Do we accept the report of the uh, committee? Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Yes. Next, we have the Standing Committee on Finance and Operations, met September 8th. Member Novick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, the Standing Committee on Finance and, and Operations met at 504 on Thursday, September 8th. Present was Vice Chair Kamara, Member Mailman, and myself. Um, representing the administration were Mr. Allen, Ms. Consalvo, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Hennessy, Dr. Friel. We also had <clears throat> Auditor Karen Spinelli and Vice Chair Johnson there as well. Um, the first thing that we took up was the audit, which it was GB 1-303, um, to review the independent accountant's report on applying agreed upon procedures for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education end of year financial report. Um, Ms. Spinelli was there representing um, Spinelli accountants and advisors and reviewed um, the findings. Um, it's, I think, probably important for my colleagues who haven't seen one of these uh, to be aware that this is specifically um, looking at the degree to which the um, the administration is adhering to the agreed upon procedures, that's very clear that that's really the scope of their work. Um, under the summary of procedures and findings for procedure two, she said there were some exceptions in several lines that did not agree that those numbers have been pre-populated. Um, I did ask about finding number 10, which was MSBA contract revenue, which Ms. Consalvo said that the line would be amended within the next week. Um, on a roll call from three to zero, of three to zero, the item was approved and filed. GB 1-146.1 
which was uh, the motion coming out of the budget um, asking for a report on bridge to resilient youth in transition. Um, as, um, as my colleague just noted, uh, Member Clancy noted that the sort of ongoing exploration of outside providers has been something that we know that this administration is moving forward with. Um, so Mr. Allen advised us that the wellness task force um, will be taking this um, along with, we know much, much else, um, along with what they're doing. Um, and thus on a roll call of three to zero, the item is filed. GB 1-208, which was um, the reviewing the status of the FY22 budget, we received um, the last report on um, FY22, which, as my colleagues know, um, ended on June 30th. Um, Ms. Consalvo reviewed the closing status. Um, for my colleagues who aren't aware, because we're a municipal district, um, any money that we have not spent by fiscal year end goes back to the city to be certified as free cash. And one thing that this um, this financial leadership has always prided itself on is um, if the Worcester Public Schools gets a dollar to spend in education, they spend it on education. Um, and so Ms. Consalvo came back with a report that closed the fiscal year specifically at $1.22, um, which I don't know that I can tell you exactly how impressive that is. It's it's really quite incredible. Um, <clears throat> we also did have a brief discussion over the fact that there was, um, when it came to sort of shifting money within the accounts, there was a lot of vacancy last year, as my colleagues are aware, and thus it was a lot of sort of moving money from some of the contracted lines down to through some of the other lines. Um, we did have a brief note in terms of the ability of administration to track vacant positions using the city's new enterprise system, um, which should um, make things more straightforward internally to administration. And then on a roll call of three to zero, the item was filed. Um, we then effectively took a number of transportation items together. As my colleagues um, are aware, we are having monthly reports on transportation within finance and operations. Um, so sort of under the umbrella um, of the general item, which is now GB2-241, which is to consider monthly updates, we did take items regarding um, electrification, the two mile radius, um, the question of how we're handling things post COVID, um, the question regarding um, after and out of school and the question of tardiness. Um, so we did receive an update from Mr. Allen um, on September transportation. Um, as my colleagues know, this is at this point uh, and weekly or almost daily shifting um, status as we have more drivers coming on and we have more buses coming on um, at that point. As noted in the report, we had 74 full-size bus drivers, 95 mid-side bus drivers, 109 bus, drive, bus monitors, and 35 drivers in training. Um, there were 17 of the ones we the buses we already had, 12 new buses, 42 leased, plus another 32 as of that day. Buses still awaiting registration and inspection. Those are the brand new ones. Um, the number of drivers currently, if they act, of trainer drivers currently, um, should they fulfill their um, licensure and fulfill the training will actually bring us up to full budgeted strength, which I know is something that we're all eagerly awaiting. Um, there was a review um, with Mr. Allen, Mr. Hennessy, and Mr. Freeman of some of what we had seen in the first couple of weeks, which I know my colleagues are very, very well aware of in terms of um, implementation of the first trend my stop, um, the technical issues we had been finding and so forth. Um, double trips don't show up in the app. There have been some adjustments made. There's a couple of things that people can't necessarily see. Um, ongoing urging of families who are having issues to call transportation, um, which is 799-3241. Um, also, a couple of things that my co colleagues should um, consider. The uh, Mr. Allen noted for us that if there is any intention of the committee making any policy changes that would require us to need additional buses next year, that that's something that we would want to be deciding in the next month or so, that that um, administration needs that lead time in order to um, order buses. So something to consider. Um, and also, the second thing is that we do have 13 buses that are coming off of lease this year. And so as administration has been considering for some time, um, the use of alternative fuels, which we know is of um, avid use or avid interest in the community. Um, part of what Mr. Allen reviewed with us at the subcommittee was the various considerations that they had moving forward. Um, <clears throat> that is also obviously something that because the, that those buses need to go out um, for order in the next month or so that needs to be decided. Um, 
the recommendation from administration is that we use propane rather than electrification at this at this time um, in part as you'll see farther on in the report um, in a response to member mailman's question um, due to the question of climate um, due to the question of the um, topography of our city shall we say um, and also the infrastructure that's needed to sustain um, electric buses the recommendation is that the um, the main buses that were that we move towards um, the propane that we pilot the use of an electric bus um, so that we can sort of continue that without it being something that we are sort of solely dependent on um, there were, as you can see um, in the report, some of the advantages reviewed um, of propane over electric, thus the change that we would be moving forward with on that. Um, we did also, I know some, I'm not the only one who's gotten questions around um, private and parochial school families wishing access to the MyStop app. That is something that's possible, but will require some additional data um, sort of syncing. And so that hasn't been top on the priority list because we're still trying to make sure that we're um, providing it for all of Worcester Public School families, but that is something that can happen. And then in terms of the discussion of out of school and after school, there was another meeting as was reported in the original backup of the, um, the, of the um, meeting. Um, there, there's ongoing sort of discussions with the out of school providers. Um, we, what we have continued to see is that, of course, we're running short in terms of the number of buses that we have and the number of routes. Um, Worcester Public School policy has always been that if there is a bus heading in a direction of an after school provider um, that has space available on it, that that is something that we then can provide to those families. Um, but we um, don't create routes just for that. Um, and obviously, as we are continuing to run short staff, that's something that we've had limited access to. Um, and so as the year goes along, <clears throat> as we have less sort of backing things up, um, there may be additional spaces coming available over the course of the year, but some of this is about the transition year as well as anything else. Uh, and I think that is everything, Mr. Chair. I hope that gives you a, a full picture of transportation. I know this is a priority for all of us. Um, the, it, uh, in terms of what we're doing with the items here, and I do just wanna reassure my colleagues because we're making a motion to file a number of them. We are faithful to having a report on transportation every month. I do wanna make sure that we, in, in the Finance and Operations um, Standing Committee, are faithful to making sure that your questions and concerns get answered, whether you're on the committee or not. Um, so what we're gonna do is have the, the general item of the monthly transportation report be reported out. Um, and please make sure that you feel that, you know, you can use that item to, to ask whatever questions are necessary that you that you need to answer, have answered in a subcommittee. Of course, I know that we all have, um, at this point, probably have transportation and Mr. Freeman and Mr. Hennessy on speed dial. Um, so the roll call was three to zero in filing um, GB9-355, GB1-101, GB2-44, GB2-109, GB2-205, and GB2-241 will be held um, for next meeting and for future meetings. And on a roll call of three to zero, the meeting was adjourned at 6.05. That's the report, Mr. Chair, for the approval of the, um, the school committee. Thank you. Thank you for the motions to accept the filings and the hold and uh, roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. Uh, Student Advisory Committee. Uh, Ms. Rushton, do you want to identify yourself in the school you're from? And Sure. Hi, my name is Nellie Rushton. Um, I'm a senior at Doherty High School here in Worcester. Um, and I just wanted to comment on the impl implementation of the Portrait of a Graduate Initiative within our school system um, and the idea of offering our students a seat at, at the table in terms of that development. Um, so last year, I was able to work with this program and uh, they were able to send out student focus groups uh, to collect input from our students. From, I know they had it at Doherty. I'm not sure where else they had it. I believe they had it at all the other high schools. I'm not sure about middle and elementary schools. But I would like to um, propose continuing that opportunity of sending um, administration out to all of our schools, not just the high schools as well as, as, well as the middle and elementary schools, so that we can include all of our students' perspectives, um, values, 
ideas and input in this portrait of a graduate um, and thus meld them with our educators' values, our administration's values, um, to really create a concrete, unified representation for a Worcester Public Schools graduate. Um, and I believe if we have the input from our students directly, um, if we continue these student focus groups, we are able to effectively and directly communicate with our students um, so that they can voice their ideas easily. Um, and this can help lead to a more easily communicated portrait of a graduate that we can implement in our schools and encourage our students with. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have the approval of grants and other financial items, 2-245. Uh, except the STEM Equipment and Professional Development Grant for the Massachusetts Life Science Center in the amount of $220,810. Again, approve on the roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? I'm sorry. Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Uh, yes. Uh, to approve the uh, two prior year fiscal payments roll call member clancy yes vice chair johnson yes member camara yes. member mailman yes member mccullough yes member o'connell novick yes mayor petty yes uh response to the administration request to provide an update on each school with security guards to include their role throughout the day and hours Member Clancy. Thank you through the chair and um, just to the administration. Thank you for this. I know that we had a little discussion on it yesterday and I'm actually fine to move ahead and file this item. Thank you. Okay. I do have a um, Member Kamara. Yeah. Thank you. I just have a question about that. Um, with regards to the security guards, I know that these are two different positions um, and once we have our um, SLOs, like are they going to be in like how, what is the format of the in that. Um, Madam Superintendent. Through the chair, Mr. Allen, I see you came on. Would you like, to, I'm, I'm happy to answer that and you can fill in anything that I may miss. Okay, so they're actually, um, the, the security officer, is that the right term? The security officers, um, they are security guards. They sit at the front of the school just to um, make sure that we don't have people coming on campus that have, we don't know that they're there. To, that's all that they do. They will not be um, engaging if there is, for example, some kind of altercation between students or um, anything like that that an SLO may do if need be. So their jobs are very different. Mm -hmm. What's that? So the yeah, uh, member uh, Johnson? Thank you to the chair. Um, I would like to, on this, I would like to make a motion before we file to um, take a look after the um, safety uh, audit of, uh, of our schools to kind of take a look at the security guys and what that role is. Maybe we expand that. Um, and with that, I would like to just ensure that you bring that back to the school committee prior to engaging in add in that additional third year to the contract that, that is here, if we could take a look at that before that is uh, completed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, uh, roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? <coughs> yes. Mayor Petty? Yes, so the motion on the re current report is to, um, Member uh, Novick? Thank you. I, I, um, first of all, I appreciate my colleague's motion on this. I was, I was going to ask for something similar. I hope that this is being evaluated as part of the security audit because I, I question the, the role here. Um, the only other question I had was um, <clears throat> knowing the careful language with which reports are prepared. Um, it says the contract term two years beginning August 25th, uh, 2022, the last day of the school year 2024 with a one year option to renew for a third and final year at the sole discretion of the city. Does that mean at the city administration or is that <clears throat> simply using a general term because um, effectively all of our contracts are through the municipality, through the chair administration. Mr. Allen? Through the chair. So uh, if I can just answer a couple of those, we just had a, a couple pieces. Yes, the, these positions are part of the security audit, so they will be re reviewing the job 
functions and the efficacy of those positions. And then to this question to Ms. O'Connell Novick, a member of O'Connell Novick's question, yes, it'll be to the West Public Schools Administration. We as part of the city, the city actually awards contracts, but it'll be at our recommendation. Okay, that's a relief. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion is to uh, accept in the file. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Oh, did I forget someone? Yes. Oh, and Mayor Petty? Oops. Yes. In response to the administration, the request of the update the community and the West Public Schools in COVID. Um, Madam Superintendent. Yes, through the chair. So our numbers um, in committee, this may look different than what you received on Friday. These are as of today. For our students, we have 135 known positive cases. That's actually 28 less than last, last reported. And for our staff, we have 62, which is eight less than eight less than last reported. So we're starting to trend down, which is what we want to see. That is all. Okay. Good, good news. And we're still giving out the booster shots over at the library. People want to look it up. I got mine yesterday. So, Member Kamara. Uh, thank you so much. To, to the chair, there um, was a time that earlier this year, um, I had an item in the agenda for us to look at these numbers. Um, maybe the easiest way would have been quadrants. Um, it, so my question is to the new administration, if we'll be able to see um, the numbers per, at least per quadrants. I know right now the, the numbers as a whole, they're decreased, yep. but God forbid. One of the things we we're also working at one time is, and maybe we didn't want to do it, is look at each school almost, and and um, if because parents ask if they have an outbreak or not. Right. So I'm not sure if that's legally uh, possible, but. Through the chair, um, I do actually think that we can do that. Um, so I will work with the team to bring that back starting at our next committee meeting just to take a look at it. We'll start through quadrants and see if that meets the need. But what I think is most important that you're saying is are we monitoring if there's some large outbreaks? And I can assure you that our nursing um, staff is. But to, to your point, we'll bring back uh, by quadrant to start and see if that meets the need. OK. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, so we'll provide an update at the next meeting. Uh, next is the response to administration. Mr. Chair. Oh, Member Novick. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues. Um, the only, uh, the additional question I had on this is because we know that people are not required to report positives at this point, um, and I, I realize I'm, I'm asking this question off the cuff, so I don't expect an answer this evening, but um, how are we trending with regard to absences? Um, since it seems to me that perhaps the more telling question is actually whether or not people are attending, not just whether or not they are reporting that they have COVID. Um, I, again, if there's an answer, I'll take it. But if there isn't, perhaps that's something that we can include in these as well in the future. Um, Madam Superintendent. Through the chair, we don't have that answer, but we can start to include that in these updates, just in terms of what's the overall um, attendance looking like for the last two weeks. All set? Thank you. Okay. Okay. We are on 2-203.1, uh, response to administration to request the superintendent update the school committee and MOU with the Worcester Police Department for school liaison offices and provide updates at subsequent school committee meetings to include plans for the working MOU. Uh, Madam Superintendent. Thank you through the chair. So based off of the feedback that we've actually received um, through um, previous reports through the, the, the safety task force, through tonight's um, public comment. We will take all of that information under advisement and then we'll continue to work with the task force and bring back something that, that brings it all together, meets the expectations of the um, state of Massachusetts and the expectations of the community. So we're taking it all under advisement and we'll bring something back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. and. Uh on this and you're one month being here or two months now <laughs> so uh okay so we can uh provide an update we can 
I guess maybe resubmit it back to you when you come back with it. Is that I'm putting it on hold? Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll provide an additional update. How's that? You can get we'll file this one. Is that all right? Oh, uh, Member Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, you you were just speaking about filing or whatever. I, I I would like to continue this. You, you know, again, I I think this is one of the worries that we might have had going into this on kind of what the MOU may yeah. look like um, when it came back, and it, and I know um, ensuring that it didn't have any impact or anything on our policies or anything like that. But again, I, I'm just when, when I read this, I was concerned that how this looked and how the other MOU, um, the state of MOU that is law looks is kind of concerning to me and I'm just wondering how or why we would settle for anything less that doesn't memorialize that state MOU in regards to our family and children here in the city to ensure that it's a robust written document that follows the law and that we are covering ourselves in the event of anything goes on. And I think that anything that comes back that is less than what or not equal to what that state MOU is, I think we're selling ourselves short as a district and that we should look further into that. And Thank I think you. Uh, we couldn't agree with you more. And uh, that's, so we can hold this one, then we get the other report, you can compare it and if you want to do that. Okay. Mom, member Mailman. I, and also, just to point out, it said we need to follow the state plan in our Ju July mi minutes, right here in our actions on 721. So, um, do we have a time frame? Or do we think this is going to be? I mean, it's already been hanging. We were looking for this when we first started. So, are we? Do we hope to see this in October? And what is the process going to be? Since we, since there's a state document that we know we're going to follow, I can't believe it's going to take all that much time. So when do you think it, we might get it back to us through the chair? Madam Superintendent. Through the chair, I would say the latest would be the second committee meeting in October. That would be the latest. We want to make sure that we bring it to the task force, um, that we work, uh, there is the work with the, the chief of police, um, but to your point, there is a model shouldn't be too much more that we need to do. It's, it's making sure that it gets on the calendar. So the absolute latest would be the second committee meeting in October, I would, guarantee, I, would, I would expect. I had told all of you that I'd have this to you, I think, next cool meeting, we got it early, so that's the plan on the next time too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Member Kamara? Mr. Chair, I just wanted to know, and I think, and, um, yeah, because I do remember that uh, for October. And um, um, I just want to ask also for the um, tax force, um, if there is a way, I'm just saying, so if there's no way, my feelings won't be hurt, um, <laughs> if to bring in, um, so from what I see here, there is um, from Citizens for Juvenile Justice, there's a guy, Leon Smith, to maybe kind of like read this over before it comes to the administration or our tables the next time. Okay, we'll do that, right? Yep, good point. Okay, so we will hold that. Oh, <laughs> Member Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, just a, a couple of additional comments to those um, that my colleagues already made. Um, I, I do, as I'm glad you noted the um, the fact that we went from sort of we were supposed to have already had this in January and nothing had happened um, to Dr. Benares coming in and kind of more than hitting the ground running. I know there's been an enormous amount of work that's gone on over the last um, number of weeks on this, so I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, it has happened and it has happened quickly after nothing had happened for a very long time. So um, kudos on that. Um, I think we, we, I know that part of what we're getting tangled in here is that we have sort of two different definitions that are happening. And I, I think maybe we need to think of this as kind of a Venn diagram, right? So there's the legal definition of what the state calls a, a school resource officer. That legal definition is something that also covers our school liaison model. But I also think it's really, really important that we are not following what is traditionally a school resource officer model because a school resource officer model actually involves the people being in the buildings. Um, so, a legal definition 
is not the same as the actual activity of those people. Um, and so let's, I, I wanna make sure that as a community, we're clear on the sort of two things that are happening at the same time, because there is something that's fairly revolutionary that's happening here at the same time. Um, there, the, the thing that I am most concerned with um, is the, the, the recognizing the safety and security of our students. And um, I, I, I did some work with my other hat on, um, on the AG's model language. Um, I, I want people to understand that that was a model. It's not something we're, we're legally required to implement that. We're legally required to implement the law, not the AG's draft language. Um, so we may use that, we may not use that, we do need to adhere to the law. And so with that in mind, um, I do wonder if the administration would be willing to consider um, a motion to have the MOU either in its current version or what, with whatever changes uh, the administration chooses to make be reviewed by an independent civil rights attorney. Um, while we don't have the authority to say yay or nay on the MOU, um, it is the school committee that actually hires attorneys. <laughs> Um, and so I, I, I would recommend us having that outside counsel. We, we do have counsels, obviously, for um, particular other things that we do. We don't have someone who particularly specializes in this. And I think that under the circumstances, given both some of the concerns that have been flagged by the community, um, as well as what I know to be kind of our own priorities, um, I would make that motion if it would be welcomed by Dr. Moneris and the administration. Okay. What's that? Dr. Moneris? Through the chair, I think it's always a good idea to have another set of eyes who are experts in the area of the law through a civil rights lens, so we would be very much um, in support of that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then I'll make that motion. Okay, so the motion, we have two motions. We take them collectively. One is to hold this report to the, to the next meeting, to October, and also um, um, Member Novick's motion, taken collectively on the roll call. Roll call. Me Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Yes. Uh, to consider the resolutions before the MASC Delegates Assembly in order to advise the Worcester School Committee's delegates. Ms. Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I put this on here uh, just as a, a matter of um, review from my colleagues. Um, the resolutions that go before the MASC Delegate Assembly um, are deliberated. Um, and so really effectively, this is intended to give us a chance, um, should we wish it, to advise, though I would recommend that we not bind the hands of Member Mailman um, as she goes to represent us in November. Um, there is, I will tell you from past experience, um, not uncommonly um, resolutions that are amended from the floor and so forth. So we don't want to send her in to say, you know, you've got to vote XXX. Um, but giving her the sense of the committee is, I think, um, a wise move on our part. Um, I will say, speaking again only for myself, um, I honestly view all the, the resolutions favorably. And obviously, of course, Resolution 1 is one that we as a committee were, um, are among those that are actually advocating directly to the, um, the Assembly for. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, consider the resolution. Roll call. Let's uh, probably the roll call. Member Mailman. I just said member Mailman. Yeah. <laughs> you don't take the roll call, do you? Okay. I had a question or a comment on number three, which was the membership of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. And so I'm favor I think all of these are great and I'm supportive. Geographic representation is um, not something that's called out and <laughs> it makes me insane for the most part, that um, we have a state our size with all kinds of different needs and everybody is within 128 that's on that board. Is that like illegal to add those words? I, I ask through the chair, I ask our MASC. Ms. Novick, you want to remember? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through the chair to my colleague. Uh, so the uh, any member of the Delegate Assembly may propose in writing um, an amendment to a resolution. Um, if Member Mailman attends the resolutions clinic, which starts a half hour before the delegate assembly, there even will be directions on how to do so. Okay. Um, I will say, just 
to be clear, there is currently at least one member who is at, from outside of, of 495. Uh, there's an portfolio. Actually, there's two. I have to think that there's now one from um, out, a second one from. Uh, so there's a one that has replaced him. Um, however, the um, I, I suspect that that would be at least welcomed for deliberation. Um, so yes, that is something that you were able to okay. do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Member Kamara. Thank you. Um, as a school, new school committee member, I just want to ask, how does all of this in here benefit our Wilsa Public Schools um, children, educators? So this is the policies that you know, Ms. Nova can address, it, I think. So uh, effectively, what's, what, what's happening um, to the chair, to my colleague, is that the delegate assembly is setting the priorities for the association for the year. Um, and so in terms of what um, MASC advocates at the State House for, um, the priorities of the Delegate Assembly are the priorities of um, both the lobbyists that are um, employed by MASC, um, as well as other act actions that take place. Um, for example, the um, president of the association sits on the local affairs, lo local government affairs committee, which meets uh, monthly with the Lieutenant Governor and others. So. Um, the, the the resolutions that are brought forward and passed are are those that are um, set forward at the state level. I do have another, a, a, sure. a, another question. Um, for resolution number one, um, there is a word that talks about children. What is the age um, range of this definition of children? I'm not sure. I would say school age children, but. Is that the right answer? So, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know if the question's addressed to me. I mean, the, no. the resolutions stand as they are. So the, there is not, I mean, the definitions of individual words are not actually provided within the resolution, if that's something that Member Kamara wishes to pass on to our colleagues to make part of the discussion, that's certainly something she as an individual member can do. Right, that's, so that's something that I would like to pass on. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I think I would note, though, that Resolution 1 is one that was already unanimously passed by the Worcester School Committee a number of months ago. I know that, yeah, but if you can just go back there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we're going to consider a resolution. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yeah. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. 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 Uh, to review the district policy regarding lunch and recess time at the elementary school level and review across the district, making the adjustments necessary. Uh, Ms. McCullough. Thank you. And through the chair to the superintendent and the administration, this is an item that I have had come up in the past, and I just want to put it back on as it is a policy. And I think it's one that we need to look at and see, um, you know, what the actual specific policies are around it have those be clear to our families and our educators and ensure that they're being consistently followed and maybe even have the conversation about ways. I know we had some students of ours advocate for additional recess time a few years ago and I know that can be challenging. It, it was a very, it, they were very prepared and compelling um, conversation and because sometimes they felt like they were rushing to eat their food just so they could get to recess, just different things that are part of that. But I know obviously we have to focus on time on learning and our requirements around that. But just looking at this overall as a district and making sure that we're following a consistent policy that is clearly stated. Thank you. Okay. we we'll send that to the Standing Committee on Teaching, Learning, and Student Supports. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Yes, to collaborate with the state and national school organizations to advocate for change in the Federal Department of Transportation policies barring commercial driver license testing in the language other than the English. Ms. Novick? As it reads, Mr. Chair. Refer to the standing committee on finance and operations. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes, to coordinate with the city installation and maintenance of public sidewalks in the interest of student safety. I'll send that to the Joint Committee on Finance and Operations and Education. Uh, Ms. Novick? As it reads. Okay, roll call. 
Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. We have an exam is 2 251. The city approve a job description for procurement coordinator. No self that one? Um, okay. Roko? I'm sorry. Um, uh, Member Kamara? Yeah. Um, I think I had a, what is this? For some reason I can't find all my documents today, but they're in there some, somewhere. I have a question, and I don't know whether or not um, this is possible, but I just wanted to understand. Um, there is a required qualification for, and I think it's item, for two, one to three years um, procurement experience within a municipality. Um, I know that this is probably like a pressing skill and skill set that the person of this role should have, um, but I wanted to understand if that could be a preferred qualification or does this or should it be a um, required qualification and whether or not that bars certain people to get in this position over others. Madam Superintendent. Through the chair, I'm going to ask Mr. Allen to speak specifically to the need for that qualification, if it could be a preferred versus um, a must-have. Mr. Allen? Yeah, I, I think, uh, through the chair, I don't think that um, needs to be a uh, required qualification. We can move that to preferred. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And I do want to ask about that scene. Um, I found my paper now. <laughs> um, the Massachusetts Certified Public Purchasing official um is that a paid certification through our public school or would that person need to pay for their own mr allen the chair we've paid for that training in the past and we would make that available to this person but it would be eventually a requirement for this position that is um the certification really needed for procurement for um positions uh done by municipalities okay thank you so the motion is to approve the uh, job description as amended. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Mayor Petty? Yes. Next is consider the approval of the job description of the evaluator of developmental readiness preschool arena. That we don't. You all like to vote this? Or? Okay, roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yep. Member Mailman? Is this a vote to hold? No, to, uh, we're going to move a roll call on the drive description. Okay, uh, um, I don't have it, so I can't vote on it. Oh. This last position. We're going to move the roll call, so we'll finish the roll call and. No. Staying. Yeah. Okay. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Next is the consent to approve the job description of the early child co childhood coordinator, the child find and teaching and learning. Oh, you missed Ms. McCullough on that one? And can we have Ms. McCullough's vote on the previous item? Ms. McCullough? My vote is yes. Okay. The report was a yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, consider the approval of the job description for early child coordinator of the child find and teaching and learning. Okay, can I approve this. Roll call. I'm sorry, I just have a question though. Sure. Um, uh, Member Kamara? Yes, thank you. Um, it, I mean, maybe this, what I have is old, but it doesn't have, uh, this agenda does not have all the things you're now naming here. Mm. Yeah, there was a, yeah, you probably didn't, yeah. There was a supplemental agenda. Um, that well, came isn't it supposed to be on this though? It comes in a separate um, email usually, and someone's adding something to it. So two or three, this has already been mailed out. So someone 48 hours before the meeting, and I, I, you're not alone in that, by the way. So yes. okay, because I don't have the, that that comes. Okay. 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 Roll call. Member Clancy. Yes. Vice Chair Johnson. Yes. Member Kamara. So you can vote no. 
Yeah, I just want to abstain for that because okay. I don't have it. Thank you. So that's no. That's an abstain. Member Mailman. So we're abstaining if we haven't seen it. Is that correct? Yes, abstain. Yes. Thank you. Member McCullough. Yes. Member O'Connell Novick. Yes. Mayor Petty. Yes. Okay, that brings us. I'm confused here. Are we all set then on this? Okay, that brings us to the end of the meeting. And it's like I say, we have style on the street on Sunday if people are interested. And uh, so we have a motion to adjourn. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. Amir Petty? Yes.